New research suggests that Bitcoin's dominance, as we all know, which is hovering around 70%, is actually closer to 90%. What, is it, what does this portent for altcoins? We're going to talk about that today. Meanwhile, in one of the most relevant struggles for human liberty and dignity, Hong Kong protesters against the tyrannical advances of mainland China have been withdrawing cash in mass from ATMs in attempts to trigger a bank run. Altcoins gear up this morning as Bitcoin seems to stall out in price. So what's the right move for your portfolio? Let's break it all down in today's exciting episode of Breaking Bitcoin. Welcome to Breaking Bitcoin, recorded live for you Thursday, August 22nd, 2019, foul year of our Lord. We are in the Breaking Bitcoin studio, your daily source for market updates, sentiment, and news for traders. I am your host, Justin Wise, lead analyst and senior mentor at CrackingCryptocurrency.com. Hopefully you guys are doing absolutely fantastic this morning. And wherever you happen to be tuning in from, whether you're watching us from across YouTube, Twitch, DLive, Facebook Live or on Roku with the Investor News Channel app if you want to support the show. Make sure to subscribe, follow, share, and engage in the live chat and hit that thumbs up button on your way in and your way out. No, 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 not on your way out. That would disqualify your life. Just once, just once, either on the way in, either on the way out. Yeah, well, we've got a fantastic show for you guys today. We're going to talk about so much. We're going to talk about price. We're going to talk about trades that we put on. We're going to talk about what's going on with China. We're going to talk about what's going on with Bitcoin's dominance, which I think is extremely important information, whether you're a trader or an investor to understand this data and how new mathematics are being calculated and correlated and how we, how we have new analytical medians to measure our profitability from. But today's episode of Breaking Bitcoin is brought to you by us. If you are an aspiring trader or an experienced trader looking to sharpen your skills and you want to work with a team with a proven track record who deal in the realm of probability, statistics, and verifiable edge, head over to premium.crackingcryptocurrency.com to see what the premium trading group can do for you. Exclusive setups, the Pathways to Profit strategy building course, proprietary indicators, spreadsheets, and tools, as well as our education material and our database library. Come join the fastest growing community of traders and investors at premium.crackingcryptocurrency.com. And as I said, we've got a fantastic show. We're going to start off today's show, as we always do, by giving away some cryptocurrency. I want to thank yesterday's participant and winner, Paul Bob the Builder, the one, the only, the man, the myth, the legend. So I want to thank this month's crypto comment giveaway sponsor, X42 Protocol. Make sure to check them out at x42.tech. And we've got 28 potential winners today. I've got to figure out why that always does that when I come in. I'm just assuming it's because somebody likes the show so much. Anyways, we've got 28 potential winners for today's show, guys. So we're going to randomly pick a winner. And it is Cracking Crypto. No. It's me again. It's me again. Come on. This is what happens when you reply to every comment that somebody leaves you on your videos. Come on, man. Come on, you go chill. You are the winner, man. He says, oh yeah, guitar for bears, EDM for bulls. Great show, awesome information as always. Much love, much love to you, my good friend. Thank you so much and congratulations on your win. Get a hold of me in the Discord and I will tip you some crypto, guys. So, without further ado, let's get into the charts. Hopefully you guys are doing absolutely fantastic. Like a two-ton man on a cobra in the grass inside it. <laughs> Stop all right, over to Bitcoin. We're going to start off with Bitcoin. Kendi, I didn't bang the table. Does that help, right? My Crypto Kirby impersonation. Look, man, he just goes short. We're going to be rich, dude. So if you just, just go short, we're going to be fine. Listen, it takes a lot, it takes a lot to hustle 
uh, on this platform. But it takes a lot more hustle to be a good trader. Moving on. Okay, so uh, starting off with Bitcoin on the daily. Let me slip over here and make sure I cover everything that I wanted to talk about. So uh, let's just talk about the basics and then we'll talk about um, where we think price is going to go and what I'm doing as a result of that. Overall market structure, we are below the daily baseline, giving us a bearish bias. Uh, let's zoom in here a little bit and maximize a little bit so you guys can see better. Okay. Uh, below the daily baseline, giving us a bearish bias. Uh, we have negative momentum coming in from Wada Atar explosion. This obviously is going to be a strong confirmation of the volume and volatility, uh, letting us know that the movement to the downside is valid. There is gas in the tank for us to take a movement to the downside. Minx has crossed below the initiation level board, below the zero line, which is the actual antecedent, which is the actual initiation of a position in our books. Uh, we also, in addition to that, also have on today's candle close, should everything be resultant, should everything be looking the way that it is today. Of course, we are about six hours and 53 minutes away from that daily candle close. We'll also have Minx crossing below the noise line, which is also another, I know individuals that are using, uh, instead of the centered oscillator function of Minx, I know that a lot of people are using Minx for the original uh, design purpose of it, to be honest with you, which was as a two lines crossing indicator. Uh, but I've gone to the centered oscillator version. I feel that it, that has a better filtration system for bad trades, but it all comes down to the latency that you program in. And of course, Minx is such an adjustable indicator that you can really run it under any settings, under any params that you want, uh, really make it look however you want or utilize it however you want, which is exactly what I do when I'm designing indicators. I design what works well, and then I try to anticipate innovations that other individuals will have, even utilizing my own code. So I've written code uh, to create indicators and had other people do unique things with it that has ended up making it into the code because it was just such a neat idea. I don't like to force a trading indicator on anybody. I teach a specific strategy, a specific way to trade the markets that has allowed me to be a consistently profitable trader. But within that framework, I encourage individuals to research and utilize their own indicators and their own permutations of indicators, because that is the key to success. Not only does it allow you to develop your own unique strategy, giving them your own unique edge in the market under the umbrella of PTP trading system, but it also allows you to feel an enormous amount of confidence in the way that you trade, in the way that you trade. So anyways, uh, getting back to the charts, we have Minx crossing and closing below the initiation level on yesterday's candle close. On today's candle close, we also seem to be having the Minx cross under under the noise line, which again, if you're using that, as I said, as your own initiation level could be a signal in and of its own right. Uh, ways that I would correlate this to what we're currently talking about is potentially an opportunity to scale further into your short position, potentially an opportunity to scale farther into it, uh, add to your position. Um, or if you are, um, oh, I guess really that's the only correlation that I could think of besides the way that I directly trade this. Uh, we still have, uh, looking down to the Fisher transform, we still have our Fisher line below our signal line, letting us know that shorts are valid as well as our indicator is not crossed over to the upside, letting us know that potentially we should be looking for a long. Of course, that would be a reversal long. That's not what we have. We also do not have time transformation uh, signaling any sort of reversal at this point in time whatsoever. We are not below the oversold level. Uh, we have actually crossed back underneath the signal line on time transformation. We're also putting in that wave cycle pattern of topping below the zero line, below the initiation level on Fisher Transform, which we cover in our premium webinar on wave cycle and theory. But essentially, very simple when you have a centered oscillator, especially the time transformation oscillator. Uh, this works well with the Fisher Transform as well, which of course is the progenitor of time transformation. When you top below the zero line, uh, that is a very bearish signal, right? That is a, that is essentially uh, something akin to hidden bearish divergence. And when you bottom above the zero line, that is going to be akin to hidden bullish divergence, allow, letting you know that the uh, that you are essentially bottoming out in an uptrend, right? It's an opportunity to buy back in. And for a short position, when you are in negative momentum, uh, it is an opportunity to re uh, reshort your asset, reshort your asset, which is exactly what we're seeing right now. In fact, uh, we are also getting regular, regular bullish divergence, or excuse me, regular bearish divergence on our oscillator as well, measured from this high to this high here on this indicator. So regular bearish divergence in here as well. So good bearish signs to see, uh, leading further credence to our short trade. If we zoom out, you can see the downside targets, the downside potentials. Uh, you know, I'm seeing a lot of long-term projections 
for you know a bitcoin i i feel that my sentiment and this is kind of rare i feel that my sentiment is for once uh being echoed by a lot of people in the price action camp of course i was talking about the negativity for a while um you know i've been kind of uh, kind of laughing at individuals that are that are buying the dip and again that's fine i'm i don't mean to say that in a negative way your trading strategy is your trading strategy your edge is your edge i would just challenge you you know, again, my questions always are, if you're a profitable trader, where's your trading journal? What is your trading strategy? And if you can't answer those questions within five seconds, we have a problem. Um, so anyways, uh, but again, coming back to the price action crowd, again, a lot of the projections that I'm seeing are are this retreat, this, this correction down to the $8,000 level. And then there's rockets underneath these lines. There's lots of lines and Fibonacci's and pretty lines on these charts, which I don't think are very conducive to profitable trading, but I will point them out and talk about them as a lot of people do. So uh, based on based on that, again, and, and I'm not really I don't really disagree with that. I don't really not not think that that's congruent. I think that the, the to be honest with you, I, you know, we're going to look at the weekly and the monthly and there are troubling signs on that as well. But the sentiment for Bitcoin still remains good. I think that we are in the appreciation aspect. The only thing that would would lead to a negative of this is that obviously in the way that we trade is that when price starts to correct and move to the downside, we're going to need to see the consolidation and the break back up to the upside before we get bullish again, before we start looking for long swings. We don't buy dips. We don't buy reversals. This isn't quick fingers Luke over here. Uh, that's just not how we do things. Uh, we are trend following traders. When the trend is bullish, we buy. And that's exactly why if you go back to April 1st, if you go back to these big breakouts, you talk about our bullishness for the market when we were writing long positions. And overall, this area of consolidation, this area of pronounced, in my opinion, distribution that we've been seeing over the last almost two months now, uh, this is a this is kind of a tricky time for trend following traders, but we've still managed to nab the majority of the movements to the upside. Whereas reversal traders or individuals that uh, that have been trying to play the swings have largely been getting crushed because again, it's just not a very consistent strategy. And the problem with that is, is that Generally, those individuals have poor money management skills in the first place, poor trading psychology in the first place. And when we actually initiate a trend, when we actually begin to initiate a trend, they're not going to do what they're not going to know what to do with themselves. Right. It's the worst situation that I've seen people be in, uh, you know, how to trade in a certain market condition and then market structure shifts and they're unable to adapt and they end up missing out on what often are the most profitable trades and setups. Uh, and it's those big losses that really just whittle away uh, all the gains that they might have made reversal trading a, a range. So. Uh, having said that, uh, that is my that's that's where I'm at. That's where I'm at with my active position in an active position currently on Bitcoin as we speak. Um, exited the uh, exited the small long position that I had opened to uh, the discretionary long position to kind of play against this. Ended up exiting that out and just holding the short trade open. That's doing well. And uh, that's about it, guys. I mean, kind of a kind of a you know, overall, we're going to talk about some other things. I mean, it's a good trading morning for me. I'm really kind of excited today. It's, it's been a good morning. Got up super early today. Did it, you know, did all, all the stuff that I'm supposed to do. That's just part of being disciplined and waking up every morning. Um, but, uh, you know, we had taken a lot of alt trades. I think that the alt market is looking, was looking very interesting last night. I think that the alt market is continuing to look very interesting this morning. Uh, so, you know, just coming in, uh, we're, you know, we got, got a lot of take profits already on our altcoin positions that we took in the group. That we put on last night and several that we put on this morning so overall a very good day for myself very good day for the group so far now uh getting kind of back into other analysis of what other people are saying about this and my comments on that you know this is a big wick down into support is one thing that i've heard a lot about and that how that is bullish so we see this big wick down into support i'm seeing well this is going to be just like the last times all these other times we've wicked down into support and then just blasted off like a rocket the problem with that is is we've weakened this level of support so much it really, for me, is going to take a crack above that $10,600 area to even potentially signal a long swing. That's going to give us enough time to gain the momentum to get up there and then enough time to prove that there's actually bearish moves. It'll give time for Minx to flip. It'll give time for Wadatar to flip. And in the past, that's always done very well for us. So um, all the major time frames are bearish, pointing and, 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 and validating downwards momentum. You know, and we don't really get bullish descending through these time frames until we get down to the two hour time frame. And water momentum is extremely weak, even on that time frame. So we go down to the two hour time frame, we can see the weakness of water. We can see the weakness of, of price uh, price structure right here and the weakness of water tar explosion to justify and allow us to take a long trade in the first place. I mean, we are pushing, we would be stretching the boundaries. And an another thing that I really don't like to see is when you're looking to take that long trade is seeing that really deep dip in the explosion levels. You can see that the explosion levels dipping. We're just barely above the dead zone as well, right? So there are conditions where this is valid, but the problem with this is, is that 
it does not lead itself into a strong trend developing out of this. It actually leads itself into pronounced consolidation, right? So I I'm okay with that. If we go back to the daily, uh, kind of what I've seen, kind of what I see going forward is, as you can see, we are in that. It's not Jaws of the Crocodile, but this is a similar s scenario that I've talked about. Uh, instead of the uh, tertiary baseline, what we have on the chart right now is, is the qualifying line to the downside. So the qualifying line where we must be within that boundary to take a trade in that direction, right? For this, in this example, shorts, right? So we are above that small black line uh, and that's coming in at 98.97. Any, any dips below 98.97, the risk to reward is not going to be conducive to taking a short trade. Um, I, I can see some consolidation. I can see some slight bouncing around. Again, that's going to be putting that re-entry zone around that $10,500 area. Of course, we can go down to the 12-hour and cor cor correlate those as well. 10,386, uh, 10,292, and I'm seeing a lot of people. I'm um, seeing a lot of people call for that as well for the for the wait to short until we get to 10,300. That's fine. But as I've made, as I've said so many times, talking about short trades. You know, when you when that's fine, that's fine to kind of have that plan in the back of your mind and maybe even add at that level, right? Uh, generally, when you are re adding at the baseline, as I've talked about many times, when we're taking reversal baseline bounces, uh, that often is a very low risk to reward add to your trade because price is going to move a very small distance before it closes or stops above the baseline, uh, letting you basically get a very cheap opportunity to add to your position, right? And really profit off the move to the downside. Now, you don't want to over risk, over leverage, that's death by sharks. Uh, you don't want to go over your risk percentage and risk input. But again, that can all be part of your calculation, right? That's all comes down to your money management strategy as far as your stop and target system. Now, uh, so yeah, correlating those levels, 10,292 and the 12-hour time frame being 10,386, all right? And really, again, as I as I spoke about previously, I'm going to need to see a crack above 10,600 before I can even contemplate long swings, right? So I'm comfortable with where we're going. I'm comfortable with market structure right now. You know, Bitcoin has that kind of capacity to really... Uh, look like it's going to break to the downside. All the signs are pointing up that it's going to break to the downside every time we've gotten these short signals. Uh, things have worked out really well. And another thing that really lends a lot of credence and strength to this, in my opinion, uh, is the rising explosion level, right? I really like to see that rising explosion level. As we've talked about before, a rising explosion level is a signal in and of itself. And if you go review my material, I go over it in, in depth in the Ichimoku video in the Trading Crypto 101 playlist. Uh, try to put a link to that up here. Maybe it's up here. I don't know. One of those corners uh, is... Um, is uh, you can you can impart discretionary position sizing into your trading system. So if you have multiple indicators that can give more or less bullish or bearish signals, then when all of those are pointing in a certain direction and more bearish than normal, uh, then that can uh, allow you to look at a larger position size. So discretionary position sizing. Uh, but that just does uh, impart confidence. Again, most trade you know single trades uh, probabilistically generally come down to a coin flip. So it is what it is, but it's a good setup. I'm very happy with it. That's where my mind and my money is pointed out right now is to the downside. So um, that's about it for Bitcoin. Let's go through the chat and see if there's any questions on that. Uh, One fly VW says, and I talk to myself on my Facebook wall. Uh, I typically argue with leftists on my Facebook wall. Uh, Satoshi Naka FOMO asks, could you please tell us about the time it takes for each time frame to happen in real markets, please? Uh, I'm not sure I... I'm not sure I understand the question. So, um, so a 24-hour candle, a daily candle is going to close at uh, 0, 0, 0, 0, UTC. It's going to open at, or actually, it's going to close at 59, 59, 59, and open at 0, 0, 0, 0 UTC. Uh, 12 hour candle every 12 hours, an eight hour candle every eight hours. So I'm not sure I understand the nuance of the question. But the time it takes for each time frame to happen in real market. I mean, the, these candles are happening in real time. Uh, now, the, the way the trading view works is they are looking at last traded price not bid or ask they're looking at last traded price so they don't really show you the spread now you can pull up the dom uh the directional order um the bomb excuse me uh the bomb which is going to show you the bid ask spread uh but in general when we're dealing with bitcoin or our larger market caps um i don't really find that i'm not an order book trader so i don't really find that conducive to enter i generally market order uh, I'll set limit orders for my take profits and a conditional market order for my exit, for my stop loss, and I move on. Snap your fingers. Do your dance. 
Fedwest attempts. Good to see you, man. Can I explain the rising explosion level? Uh, the rising explosion level is a calculation in Wadatar Explosion. And what that imparts is that the Bollinger Bands are separating apart from each other. Meaning not only... So you have two components to Wadatar Explosion. You have Volatility and you have Momentum, right? And... Uh, momentum, so so very similar to any momentum indicator, right? When there's bearish momentum, when price is moving down, depending on the strength at which it's moving down, uh, you're going to have more momentum, negative momentum, and that is a directional, that is going to give you directional bias, right? Which direction you want to trade in, and is momentum strong enough for you to want to trade in, right? Uh, because it's not just momentum on this candle, it's momentum measured against the momentum of the previous candle. So I really like that about Wadatar Explosion is that uh, it's, it's momentum is tied to relative momentum based on recent history and price, right? So you are measuring, is this momentum enough to break us out of this consolidation period and really initiate a strong trend? That's the point of water tar explosion. And the rising explosion level is an additional volatility indicator that lets you know, are the Bollinger Bands separating or are they contracting? If the Bollinger Bands are contracting, generally that means that volatility is escaping the market and we're, uh, we're seeing trend exhaustion or trend weakness. But if the Bollinger Bands are separating, then that generally means that we are breaking out of consolidation and we are going to experience a trend. What are my thoughts on John McAfee? He's a fucking hero, man. One of the funnest people to follow on Twitter. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Manny Masood, in your thinking, uh, will Bitcoin fill the gap around 8,500 this time on the CME? I mean, it is possible. Uh, it is possible. I haven't looked at CME gaps in a while. It's not a big part of my trading strategy. I will. I've said this before. You know, Bitcoin does tend to have a good propensity to fill gaps. But if it does not immediately backfill gaps, I find that it typically the, those gaps are not valid. Right. So I think gaps are more important for intraday open and close. I don't think they're really important for um, price levels on the chart. I really don't. I really don't think they are. I think if a gap doesn't get filled nearly immediately, like within a day, I, I, I think that it becomes less valid. What's up, Mr. Ether? Ninja Fist TV and the voice of reasoning kicks in again. Tic Tac Crypto. How did you find out about QLF? I found him two years ago when I entered the space. He disappeared. I have... um. I've thoroughly studied, uh, you know, QFL's style of trading, right? I have written scripts about it. I have written strategies around it. I've traded QFL strategy for a while. You know, and quick fingers, Luke, like he's not a bad guy. He's a very intelligent guy, has a unique strategy. It's not really unique, honestly, c coming from the realm of trading Forex and stocks. But, but uh, you know, he's got entertaining content. Um, I don't think that his strategy is great. Uh, there are some significant risk management issues with it. And that is, you know, again, one, uh, but, you know, I played around with it. I experimented with it. I tried to trade it. Um, you know, it has some potential in, insofar as automation. But again, it only takes one bad trade to blow you out with QFL strategy. So uh, there are issues. There's a lot, you know, but there's a lot of infrastructure built up around it. So again, I, I you know, I don't uh, hold people back from going out and testing stuff out. It just, it just didn't make it into my system whatsoever. Um... So it's like weighted average momentum of a sort. Something like that. Yes, very similar. Yeah. Uh, Satoshi says, hey, Justin, I see Tone Vase is interviewing a lot of good traders. Would you consider going on his show? I, I'd love to. I'd love to. You know, one of the things we want to do more on this show is, you know, bring more individuals on. Uh, I'm actually talking to a lot of people. You know, I just want to make it more entertaining for you guys. And I think that having conversation... You know, I think that having conversations about, you know, trading and trading strategy and trading psychology, that's really what I want to focus on is discipline and trading psychology. Because I feel that, you know, so many people want to talk about analysis and, and strategy and price points and price predictions, and that's all fun and good and that's all well. But at the end of the day, what really is going to make you a successful trader is discipline and psychology, right? And yeah, that's, that's what I want to promote and talk about on this show. Okay, bum ba dum bum bum on to Ethereum. Oh, you know what? Before we do that, I did want to look at the weekly. Uh, and to do this, we will go over to Bitstamp. Look at the longer term chart just to have more price data. And let's go to the weekly chart for Bitcoin. And I wanted to, to point a few things out here. Um, so, uh, interestingly enough, 
So, you know, we talked about this a little bit a few weeks ago. We talked about this candle right here where we closed down toward the baseline. This was really the um, uh, this was really the first tap of the baseline. You can see we actually touch the weekly baseline on this candle. Uh, this is back on the uh, 22nd of July's weekly candle, right? Uh, we have two more weeks uh, of um, we have two more weeks of appreciation following that, and then right back down to the baseline. And we've actually now, uh, if this candle closes the way that it is, uh, we have actually flipped uh, to slightly bearish momentum. Now, on the weekly time frame, we're still not ready for like long-term positional shorting. Uh, the momentum, the trend is not there yet. Uh, but we can see again this rising explosion level and a green column printing above the dead zone in the explosion level starting over here really starts right here after this nice uh, breakup weekly candle start that again the big breakout starting after after April 1st and then it's just expansion it's just expansion after that uh, until this candle right here letting you know to be out of your trade and had you just followed that right there had you just done that uh, that would have got you into Bitcoin at around 5,176 and got you at around 9,510 so almost a doubling of your money almost a 2x uh, so interesting. Uh, anyways, on the weekly time frame, we flipped to bearish momentum for the first time this year, uh, the first time this year since the breakout from April. I don't want to say the first time this year, because obviously back in uh, January, we were still reeling a little bit from bearish momentum. But you can see the, the falling off, the tapering of the bearish momentum as we descended into the $3,000 area. And then the slow buildup of bullish momentum really leading to this nice breakout. And it's just beautiful, long multi-month trend. Uh, and now we're in this period of distribution. We're distributing. We're in a very tight band around the baseline. Uh, if we flip the direction of the qualifying line, you can see that as well. Right? You can see that tight band that we're consolidating in around the daily base, or excuse me, around the weekly baseline in this particular example. And cracking the weekly baseline would be the first example of this so far since the bullish breakout from April of... April 1st of this year. Uh, and that's going to, I think, foreshadow a pretty significant and pronounced trend to the downside. Now, uh, you know, how low do we go? Blah, 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 blah. We don't do that on this channel. We, we ride trends in the direction of the trend, right? And I think that the resulting trend that is upcoming is going to be the trend to the downside. Uh, and when we break out above that and market structure changes, well, then we'll go to the upside. But you can see that you don't really need these, you know, buy the dip mentalities. You just need to know where the baseline is and you need to know the direction of the trend. MT Coiner, good to see you, my good man. Uh, Jay Kreutzer asks, do I mind going over the dead zone and how am I incorporating it into my trading? Um, you know, so I talked about this a little bit uh, yesterday as well. There's actually a timestamp in yesterday's video going over the dead zone. Uh, but the dead zone filter is just a long ATR filter. It's looking at ATR over a long period of time. And I'm actually going to, uh, I have a couple updates that are supposed to be coming out this week. I got them on my post-it notes here uh, to make a little bit of a modification of the code. Just go over it. Uh, I want to update it to version four, and I also want to include a couple features that I've written in my, you know, and, and personally that I want to push publicly for everybody to use. Uh, and one of those is going to be the ability to adjust not only the multiplier, but also the look back length for that dead zone. So that you can adjust it to the asset class that you're trading and figure out what works best for you. And what the dead zone is, it's just a, it's just looking at the average true range over a long period of time and, and using that as an additional filter. So saying that, okay. So we figured out what the average ATR is over, set, let's say, the last six months. And we want to be trading above that, all right? We don't want average volatility because average volatility means no trend. We want unnatural volatility, meaning that we want an unnatural trend. We want something that is unnatural. We want an unaveraged true range, if that makes sense. Uh, and when we have an average true range that is above the median over a very long period of time, that is a uh, a very good um, that is a very good indication that there is potential for us to be entering into a trend rather than just experiencing fluctuation and noise in the market. So uh, the way that it works from a practical level is we need our uh, column on Wadatar Explosion to not only be above the explosion level, but also above the dead zone, right? Also above the dead zone. Ooh. Congratulations, Trees. Great 40%. Sorry, guys little bit of a yawning action coming in here all right so it's 12 30 let's uh, after looking at that weekly and kind of talking about what that portents uh, let's go over to ethereum okay 
uh you know so here on ethereum right even though we have a um an up candle right where our close seems to be greater than it's open it's looking like it is going to be closing that way uh it's still bearish on the Heikenashi chart it's still bearish on the Heikenashi chart and even with this propulsive buyback i don't really expect the dollar pair to do much moving forward now now the bitcoin pair on the other hand was a screaming buy last night uh, and that's why we moved in on it um so I do actually expect to see a little bit more continued bullishness from the alt pairs. Uh, we'll see if this is just going to be a reactionary alt pair, but we did happen to catch this one this time, uh, you know, and, and it's just good because there was just more strength and we often avoid these, you know, very reactive moves from altcoins that try to jump randomly and they try to sucker people in because they think they're going to be trending long. Uh, but I think the signals yesterday on a lot of our good alts were, uh, were different, were stronger, were better, were better volume. And that's why we moved on a lot of them. And that's worked out pretty good for us moving into the morning, moving into the morning trading and the morning profit taking. So uh, interesting to point out here on Ethereum is that we do have a fresh Fisher transform crossover, right? So what that is indicating, we actually had it on yesterday's candle. And what that is letting you know is that you should be at a short. So had you uh, just been following the Fisher, you would have you, you would have exited your short at the absolute bottom, right? You would have exited your short at the absolute bottom. Uh, now, I don't see this as having sustained movement. It just lets us know that all this uh, indicator means for me is that we should be neutral until we get the bearish momentum back, right? So as you can see, we are trading below the dead zone on uh, on water tar explosion. But this was just your last indicator to be out of your short position. As you can see, we actually got the short signal. You know, Minx actually crossed bearish over here on the 8th of August. If you transform cross bearish actually on an up candle, you would have sold pretty much at the absolute top at that point, right at the baseline on the 10th of August, signaling a little bit after that. So, uh, you know, current strategy right now is long F, bit, uh, long F Bitcoin and hedged flat on F USD. Now with CoinSwap on Bybit, which they just introduced, CoinSwap is live on Bybit. You just transfer over the BTC that you have, or excuse me, transfer over the Ethereum that you have to um, to Bitcoin and utilize that as hedge or, or uh, to add to your short position. Uh, you don't actually have to worry about keeping your funds hedged by having to hold them in Ethereum on Bybit. So uh, one great thing about one thing about the CoinSwap feature. Uh, looking over at EOS, uh, looking over at EOS. Now, I want to point this out. OK, uh, we'll go to the two hour chart. And I did I did take an EOS. Boom, bam. I did take an EOS long this morning at about six o'clock in the morning. I didn't publish that anywhere because it's my it's a new system that's being forward tested. It's being live tested. I don't publish signals or provide setups with trading strategies that do not have months of financial data. Uh, everything that we publish is back tested, data tested, proven to have a statistical edge. Um, but, uh, you know, we did, I did take an EOS long USD uh, this morning. It wasn't a big position or anything like that, but again, um, about $300 in profit so far. So I just nothing, nothing to write home to mom about, but good trade, good trade for the morning. Uh, targeting really this 370 area and we're at 369.99. I've taken a little bit of profit on the way up, move the stop loss to break even so. Uh, just the way they do, uh, just the way that we do. But, you know, this was only for the two hour time frame. That's really the, the time frame that I'm focusing on for these two new strategies, two hour and the eight hour. Uh, but let's go to the daily and we'll just kind of start from there. So I'm out of daily shorts. Uh, out of daily shorts uh, is my prognosis on this. We're still below the daily baseline. So obviously the reversal baseline bounces there. Um, but out of daily shorts for right now, we can see the rising explosion level. We can see water tar explosion really telling us not to do anything. We can see the crossover on time transformation. Um, Let's see here. Let's see here. Uh, so uh, out of daily shorts, you know, if, if anything, looking for pullbacks for intraday longs, if anything, but for long swings, for long daily setups, you know, stay hedged and wait for direction, right? We need to see a nice crack above the 37070 70 area, the $3.77 area. Uh, if we descend down to the 12 hour and the eight hour, we are starting to get good signals. Again, we did get an eight hour signal uh, earlier this morning that that was a valid setup taken on the eight hour time frame. 12 hours, not quite there yet. Uh, we are, uh, Minx hasn't crossed up to the upside. So again, the highest time frames that we look for for interdirectional trades. Um, so the daily and the 12 hour, are, they're just not there yet. The eight hour gave us a signal, but we can see that the eight hours a little edgy utilizing that strategy again, uh, running different indicators, running a different indicator, indicator sweep uh, for the two hour setup. But again, the two hour setup was good. Uh, we've gotten very good signals on the two hour time frame for pretty much all of our Bybit pairs. Uh, so for the Minx Wada strategy, uh, which is, you know, the main one that we teach, uh, or not that we teach, but uh, uh, the main one that, that you get when you walk in the door on top of many strategies that you get. But uh, this is just one that you that you can utilize. It works very good on the two-hour chart. I found on the USD pairs over on Bybit. But out of daily shorts, as I said, looking for pullbacks and intraday longs, if anything, uh, which is not likely what I'm going to be doing because that's kind of stepping outside of my strategy. But if you're looking for long swings on the higher time frames, I would continue to stay hedged and wait for direction. Uh, same with XRP USD. Again, good. Uh, not as good. Again, a little bit of a, a little bit of a buyback. But same thing. Looking for. Uh, 
you know, I'd be looking at, if anything, looking for intraday longs. If anything, no long swings, staying hedged, waiting for direction on this. Again, nothing really clear until we go down to the two hour time frame. And again, this was more of a very weak, you know, this was not a signal. This was not a signal right here. WADA did not confirm below the dead zone. And then just a big explosion and very low opportunity coming up after that. Do I think that more could be resulting from that? Yes. But again, uh, that's really not, this is not, uh, this is not really what I want to trade. It's not really what I trade. Now, I will say we are getting a two hour rising explosion level. This candle is going to close in 23 minutes. So you can try and take this breakout trade right here. If you did take this XRP USD long, uh, you'd be looking over at 27 cents, 28 cents, 28 and a half cents, right? So 27.7, 28.1, 28.5. But with a stop pretty much right at the two hour baseline. I would prefer to see a little bit of a pullback to that daily baseline and take it based off of that. Again, just my that's just my discretion. That's just my subjectivity looking at the chart. You should take a signal when your system generates a signal. All right, so let me go back through the chat, see if there's any questions on that. Uh, what settings do I use for Fisher? Uh, the, the current settings that I have for Fisher on the chart for the purposes that I use Fisher for are going to be a length of 10, a source of HL2, and a trigger length of 8, and trigger smoothing is going to be default, right? So... Uh, in my version of uh, a Fisher Transform, we have lots of different smoothing types, and obviously we can choose our source. Uh, but other than that, and, and of course, to be honest with you, uh, this is not the... Um, I think you'll have good good results with the default Fisher, the Fisher that's available on TradingView. Uh, if you are looking to use it on altcoins, I recommend using H. Potter's version. Um, but uh, I rewrote the Fisher Transform algorithm. I think the way that I rewrote it is more accurate, just taking a look at the math and and not really looking at the math, but looking at the way that the math was translated for TradingView. Uh, I think that I don't really like the way that they did the calculation. Um, anyway, so I rewrote it uh, and rewrote it in version three, which is fine. I just want to rewrite it or I just need to upgrade it to version four. That doesn't change any of the calculations. It just changes the plotting and inputs and anything like that. It doesn't change any of the math. Uh... What are my thoughts on the fear and greed index? It's at the all time low at five. You know, I, I think that, um, battery's low. I think that the fear and greed index is, you know, not anything that I've ever traded off of. I don't really have any strong thoughts and opinions on it. I mean, it's, it's, I hear that it's, that it's helpful sometimes to establish directional bias. Uh, but it just kind of falls into the realm of a lot of the stuff that we've tried to look at on this stream and a lot of stuff that we filtered out because you know, you know, pretty much all the information you need is just right there on the chart, man. You know, just clear, objective data. Um, so, and, and I guess the other issue that I have with the fear and greed index is the same, you know, I pointed out a lot of the stuff that other, other traders have popularized as well, which is, you know, looking at this sentiment and looking to trade against it and more often than that, that does not work out well. I think that you should use sentiment data I think that you should use sentiment data to trade in that direction for the most part, right? Uh, and it's having a it's having initiation triggers that are sensitive enough to get you in at the beginning of a trend and not when the trend is exhausted, which is what most indicators will do. Uh, what's changed from version three to four? Uh, differences on how you do inputs, differences on how you do sources, differences on how you do plotting. Uh, they've added some funky features like you can uh, do you can do drawing tools on charts now, which is I think overrated. But you know, a lot of people think it's interesting. Did I ever cover? Did I already cover Ethereum Classic? No, I did not. Uh, we did go long on Ethereum Classic last night, uh, and we just hit take profit three on that. Continues to rise, trailing stop. So, uh, but we'll take a look at it real quick. And we'll look at that. And we got uh, a lot. To go. Uh, here we are, Ethereum Classic on the two hour, just a great last two hour candle. Uh, so anyways, you can see uh, here is where we just moved our stop loss to break even. But yeah, just a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful propulsion of the upside. Great bullishness on Ethereum Classic USD. And again, we got that nice, we got that nice signal. We ended up taking it yesterday. We took it yesterday on yesterday's daily close. Uh, actually, one day late on that trade. But again, uh, the volume was good. The rising explosion level was really good. And again, that rising explosion level, as we can see here in Wadatar explosion, really led to a better signal. Minx confirming, uh, Fisher confirming. Everything was good. Everything added up right. It was just a good, good, clean signal closing above the baseline. And when you trade, I, it's not like I predicted that that price would shoot up this high. Very pleased with it. Very, very pleased with it. It's a big winner for us. But, um, but it's just... It's just when you trade in the direction of the trend, 
good things often happen. And when you try to trade reversals, generally you get your face smashed in. All right, I want to take this brief opportunity to thank the new members to the community. Uh, so Sarah Rockford, Take5, and Rico San Diego, thank you guys so much for joining us over there on YouTube. And of course, uh, Agupta, 2432, thank you so much for the follow over there on Twitch, my good friend. Welcome to the community, guys. All right, um, if there's no more questions on that, we're going to get into... Um, I actually prefer a linear trail stop. Uh, there's nothing wrong with um, uh, there's nothing wrong with uh, there's nothing wrong with Donchian. Donchian actually works really really well. Um, you know that's actually something I'm going to be coding into all my indicators because it's been requested. Of course, I coded it into Ichimoku, obviously, which runs off Donchian calculations. But um, you know, and Donchian is just a just a loose term for what you know for the average of the high low over a look back period. But so it's basically HL two. But um, or, or median price, basically. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I just do, my trailing stops are based off of profitability, right? So as I trail my stops up, as, as take profits get hit, my, my trailing stop gets tighter and tighter and tighter. Uh, and then we get to that level where I've really surpassed profit, and I just want to lock that profit in. Uh, zero minus touch zero asks, I'm slightly interested in traditional markets, but the market closes seem very different from Bitcoin being open 24 seven, giving far more data. For instance, how well does market technical analysis translate from 24 seven markets to markets that close and open? Uh, I don't really think they translate differently at all. Um, I think that your indicators are going to be based off of closing data. So you're not losing any data because that data just isn't there. So if you have, if you're looking at a chart that you know, opens and closes and isn't open on the weekends, that you're not missing anything because there was no trading that, that took place there. Uh, there's little nuances and specific strategies and all these kind of things that you can trade when it comes to stocks and everything. But again, I find that having an if this, then that strategy that you can tweak and tune to the asset class that you're going to be trading is the tool to success, man. You pair that with good money management and good psychology and sticking to the plan. And it's hard to, it's hard to not, if you just put in the work, it's hard to not, not see the, re the rewards and the results of that. Now, I do think that when it comes to traditional markets, there is more leeway for trading reversals. Uh, I think there is more leeway for fundamental analysis. But again, I don't think they're necessary. And I think that often traders can find themselves bogged down by incorporating too much information or too much data into their trading strategy. All right. Uh, so what do we want to do? I think we're going to go back to looking at Forex starting on Monday. So we're going to not include Forex for this week, but we are going to bring Forex in starting next Monday. I know a lot of guys are excited to get back into that. Just kind of revamping and reorganizing. So maybe by Monday, I'll, I might even have some different indicators for Forex. Uh, but very confident with what I'm doing right now. Just making some structural changes to what I'm doing now that I've got a couple months almost of back testing data or uh, forward testing data after about nine months of back testing data. So, uh, so let's get let's get into the news. We're gonna get into today in Bitcoin. Before we do that, as traders, selecting our exchange is going to be one of the most important decisions that we can make. As a professional, I'm often asked, what are the metrics that I use when evaluating what exchange to use? And I always say the same thing. The three metrics that you should evaluate strenuously are customer service, security, and ease of use. Uh, and the platform that I use for trading Bitcoin futures that I find checks all those boxes is Bybit. Their platform is intuitive and simple to use, yet it also has advanced order features that I think are absolutely necessary for seasoned traders and myself. Uh, their customer service live chat is in the bottom right-hand corner. That's what really sold me on Bybit. 
Uh, in fact, I just got a message this morning uh, from a member of my group who said that he had a good experience with Bybit. There was an issue. He broke his phone. He didn't have access to some of his data. He was able to verify himself and he was able to get access to his data. So you just don't have, I've never found a good exchange for cryptocurrency with customer service and Bybit does that. So uh, they're just implemented CoinSwap. They've got a lot of cool, neat features. If you guys would like to try out Bybit for yourself, you guys can use our link in the description down below. That's bybit.crackingcryptocurrency.com. If you use that link, Bybit will give you up to $60 to test their platform out. It's a margin bonus. You can't withdraw the money or anything, but you can use it to generate profit, which you can then withdraw. So if you guys want to take the Pepsi taste challenge and see why Bybit is better than BitMEX, bybit.crackingcryptocurrency.com. All right, guys, so we've got some fascinating stuff to talk about. Okay. Boom. That's uh, pretty small, but it, uh, I'll get to it here in a second. So we all know that Bitcoin's dominance has been hovering around 70% for quite a while. As altcoins continue to be punished by the market, through currency devaluation. Now, in this scenario, we've heard the continual cry of alt season is right around the corner, bro, and dollar cost average into your alts. But what if I were to tell you that Bitcoin's dominance was closer to 90%, if not greater? Well, don't take my word for it. Researchers at Arcane Research have just published a report as reported on by Forbes over here, but I'm gonna be quoting the original article by the company that actually made this website, Cryptographin. Shout out to my Norwegian listeners out there uh, instead of the Forbes article. So uh, <laughs> they found that if one adjusts their calculation, let's scroll down here a little bit. If one adjusts their calculation to include liquidity, therefore calculating a volume weighted market capitalization, Bitcoin's dominance soars to over 90%. Now, this would reduce the rest of the combined market cap to less than 10%. Now, the logic behind this is that analyzing market capitalization independent of a market's liquidity is meaningless. You could easily create a cryptocurrency with 1 billion pre-mined coins and do one trade at $3 per coin. That would make the current price of your token $3 and lead to a market capitalization of blah, 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 boom, $3 billion. Now, that would be at current valuation in today's market cap, a 1% share of market dominance. And that would inflate the total market capitalization. And you could do that for three bucks. Now, obviously, this is ridiculous. You have to take liquidity into account. Of course, you could sell one of your made up tokens for $3, but there would be no market for you to sell 1 million of them at that price. Now, the problem is measuring liquidity is not straightforward as anybody who's done professional trading knows. To be accurate, one would need to measure slippage. So slippage is how much price moves when you execute a large order and the spread or the spread being the difference between the bid and the ask price. Now, large slippage and a wide spread indicates low liquidity, which is the case for most altcoins. Now, a simpler method, a simpler calculation, one that is often used as a proxy is trading volume. So the analysts at Arcane Research utilize trading volume to adjust relative market capitalization to arrive at a more meaningful measure of the relative strength of the different coins and tokens. With this measure, Bitcoin's dominance jumps to over 90%. This was found to be true whether the analysts used the volume reported to buy coin market cap or whether they used the data from the Bitwise Real 10 exchanges, the exchanges that are uh, reported to not have any wash volume and that are reported to have only real volume. Now, now this aspect, this fact of Bitcoin's dominance has been speculated at for a while. And the longer that alt season is delayed, the more this effect becomes more pronounced. Now, as the analysts conclude, it is difficult and potentially unfair to compare and contrast different projects targeting different niches. So when we compare quantitative data, qualitative data that might be important and difficult to quantify by its very nature, because it's qualitative data, not quantitative data, gets brushed aside and isn't taken into evaluation. However, history has shown us that network effects generally outperform specialization. Platforms designed for general use with wide adoption tend to just be used for everything rather than these specialized niches being utilized, right? So very similar to the internet. So nowhere are the network effects stronger than with money itself, where liquidity is literally everywhere. Every single day that Bitcoin remains 
with its market cap supremacy, it becomes more and more and more unlikely that any other crypto will be able to compete with it as money. And this is important. This is important information for investors, developers, and merchants, uh, and especially those who are developing cryptocurrency payment solutions. If you're confused, if you're confused about what to invest in, if you're looking at cryptocurrency, and you're like, hey man, maybe I should add Komodo to my portfolio. You can't go wrong with Bitcoin. Ken says, it was weird. When I sold out of my Bitcoin near the top, I had $300 price slippage to the upside. So I sold within $100 of the top for real. Just got pushed up by a big market order, man. The FOMO is real. Binance adds OCO order type to their web platform. So it's finally here, guys. It's finally here. You can now set a take profit and a stop loss simultaneously on Binance without the need for a third platform. Although I still recommend people use three commas. I think it's much better, but I digress. Still a whole lot that you can't do on Binance, but <laughs> I mean, we've been asking for this for such a long time. And just as Americans are about to be kicked off the platform here, Binance comes in the clutch, adding that nice functionality and congratulations to the hodlers over there across the pond. You guys get the spoils of the reward. So for those of you who don't know what OCO orders are, OCO stands for one cancels the other. Meaning that you can set in this practical case, uh, if you buy an asset, you can set a take profit, which is higher than current market price and a stop loss that is lower than current market price. And when either one of those triggers, it cancels the other order, right? So prior to this, you could not set a take profit and a stop loss simultaneously on Binance because uh, you would need to, the way that Binance worked is say you bought 50 Ripple and you wanted to set a, a sell order for 50, a limit order to sell that 50 Ripple at a higher price. Um, that would lock up your 50 Ripple. And then you could not then set a stop loss order, which is a stop market buy order or stop market sell order, excuse me, um, for 50 Ripple because it would say, well, you don't have 50, you don't have another 50 Ripple. Um, so this was a huge problem because individuals really could not manage the risk on Binance. And that's why, you know, Binance kind of became a meat grinder and has been a meat grinder when it's not a bull market. When it's a bear market, Binance is a meat grinder. Um, and that's why, again, I recommend three comments. You guys can go to uh, three commas dot cracking cryptocurrency dot com. If you guys would like to try their platform out for free as well. That's what I use. I have the I have the pro plan, all the bells and whistles. Um, and anyways, so my, my entire point is my entire point is, is that now you can now you can set a take profit and a stop loss simultaneously. Uh, it allows you to combine a stop limit order and a limit make it order on the same side with the same quantity. So uh, you can't do different quantities. There's still like some differences in it. Like you can't set conditionals like uh, it's basically, it's very similar to like the, even though Bybit lets you do this, um, it's very similar to when you open up an order on Bybit, you have the option to set a stop loss and a take profit. That's going to be for hundred percent of your order. So obviously the workaround is to set the stop loss. Uh, but the nice thing about Bybit too, is that you can set, you can scale out your stop loss, right? You can just use the conditional market order, conditional limit order, whatever you want to do uh, to set those buy cells, uh, those stop sell orders. And then you can use the limit order to set limit sell orders, right? Often we have to walk people through this. It's not too complicated, but again, using platforms can often be confusing for people. And I just want to walk people through this as easily as possible. So that's there, man. That's there. Now I want to get into the story of the day. Then we'll answer questions if we have anything else to go over. And I think this is really important. So, you know, guys, this is this is really, really near and dear to my heart. You're welcome to disagree with me on where I go with this. Um, but this is just being as honest as I can. So uh, protesters in Hong Kong have taken to a new non-violent tactic, and that is withdrawing cash in mass from ATMs and banks and converting it into U.S. dollars. Now, the demonstration is meant to protect people's wealth from the possibility of devaluation following a military crackdown from mainland China while reasserting the freedom of Hong Kong's independent financial structure. Now, what is going on in Hong Kong is one of the most important battles that could be fought right now. So many of us in this space talk and talk about freedom and liberty and rail against the evils of socialism. But what's going over, what's going on in Hong Kong right now is one of the most important battles that could be fought. It's real boots on the ground. This is happening right now. Real fight for liberty against tyranny. Hong Kong, after being ran by Britain for years, 
is much more synchronous with Western-style liberalism and economics than the crushing imperialism of communism. For those of you who don't know anything about this issue, the issue in Hong Kong uh, all began over an extradition bill that was approved by Hong Kong's chief executive, Carrie Lam. Now, this bill would allow case-by-case -case transfers of fugitives in Hong Kong to jurisdictions without extradition treaties with the city of Hong Kong, mainland China being one of those. Now, this is a major problem for political dissidents who have found sanctuary in Hong Kong and who have fought against the tyranny of China. The infiltration of China's political agendas into Hong Kong's legislation has already begun with reports of government officials being bribed and paid off by China to push their political agendas. And these fears are not unfounded either. When Xi Jinping, president forever of China, rose to power in 2012, the space for political dissidents shrunk substantially. Human rights activists have claimed that disappearances have been on the rise, with even the BBC, liberal as they are, reporting that the Communist Party's control, control has become tougher and more systematic. And this is what inevitably happens in socialist countries. It absolutely amazes me to this day the cognitive dissonance between what those who advocate for socialism believe and what reality has proven to us time and time again. Governments are largely terrible at everything they attempt to control. Human beings do not perform well under coercion. The looming threat of China stretching its tendrils into Hong Kong to extradite those who speak out against their atrocities is a massive concern for the citizens of Hong Kong, and it should be a huge concern for all of us. It's another threat of a tyrannical government triumphing over freedom and basic human rights. The right to protest your government is and still was, it was and still is a revolutionary idea that America, among very few other countries, was founded upon. The right to assemble and peaceably protest was an exercise that was throughout history banned and cracked down upon with brutal violence from governments, monarchies, and dictatorships. Even over in China right now, protesters are waving American and British flags, singing the national anthem of the United States as a form of protest against China. The narrative that capitalism or freedom is despised by the majority of the world is just that. It's a narrative. All across the world, People live in subjugated countries, live under tyrannies, and they dream and they yearn for freedom and deliverance from totalitarianism, from, totalitar from totalitarianism and tyrannical governments. Unfortunately, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Unfortunately, it seems that there are still many in this world that wish to hand more and more power over to these despots. And by despots, I mean governments. So. These mass withdrawals of cash from ATMs are already generating reports that ATMs are running out of cash, with some protesters making multiple trips to multiple ATMs to overcome the equivalency of $2,500 US limit per transaction. It's about 10,000 HKD. Now, while things are not dire for Hong Kong banks yet, enough people participating in this event has the potential to disrupt cash access in the city and, in an extreme scenario, instigate a citywide bank run. Now, all of this foreshadows the power that something like Bitcoin has for people and cities in such a predicament. China has maintained tight capital controls that allow them to maintain an artificially low trading peg with the United States dollar to stimulate their exports. And this manifests for Chinese citizens in the form of strict financial laws on the mainland. For example, Chinese citizens can only acquire and move $50,000 out of the country per year. And these cross-border transactions are, are centrally recorded and closely tracked, closely tracked. There are also controls on domestic currency movements. And this systematic devaluation and management of the yuan means that Chinese citizens are being deprived of the real purchasing power of their money. It's taxation in any other form. Chinese law prevents most of their citizens from investing in safer and more lucrative foreign investments. Again, safety of their capital and more uh, more capital growth, more uh, ability to appreciate. Compounding this is currency devaluation, which decreases mainland consumption, economic consumption, and makes their economy even more dependent on their exports. Obviously, this is further extenuated with the escalating trade war. <sighs> so... The other thing that's concerning is the rate of the renminbi to the dollar, right? 
The dollar peg got cracked for the first time. Now, with the advent of Bitcoin, people around the world living under financially controlling regimes like China have an opportunity to participate or to reject the system, excuse me, in a nonviolent way that in mass can crumble a government. Instead of being forced to watch their purchasing power dwindle and dwindle and dwindle under an oppressive government, they can buy Bitcoin. Bitcoin is nearly perfect for protesters and dissenters. It's non-confiscatable, and you can use it to transfer very large amounts of wealth cross-border without the need for approval or fear of censorship. Black markets have and are growing around the world in countries just like China with escalating volume and peer-to-peer transactions, with peer-to-peer transaction volume skyrocketing in countries like Venezuela, Belarus, Kazakhstan. Bitcoin gives people the ability and the power to hold their governments responsible for unscrupulous currency management. And if the trend continues, which it will, China has every reason to be worried. And so do totalitarian governments around the world. All right, let's go over to the chat. The bureaucracy expands to meet the needs of an expanding bureaucracy. Very true. Eisenberg. Hey, man. I hear you make good product. Uh, He says, thanks for the stream. Can you please elaborate on hedging, being long and short simultaneously, shifting capital between the two positions according to direction, and how that can be better than a 1x short? Um, so I, I I don't really think that it can be, you know, because if you are holding... So let's just take a very simple example, right? Let's just start with basics. So if you have $1,000 and you buy Bitcoin, if you have $1,000 worth of Bitcoin, and you transfer that onto Bybit... Uh, you are now long. Uh, you are now long $1,000. Uh, meaning that the amount of Bitcoin that you have will not change. But the dollar value of that Bitcoin will change based on the exchange rate of Bitcoin to the dollar. BTC forward slash USD. So your base currency in this situation is Bitcoin. And your quote currency is dollars. Right? Uh, you know, obviously that we won't go down that route. But if you were to compare it against another quote pair, like for example, how much is the Bitcoin that you have worth in Ethereum, the number would be different as well. But whatever is on the right side of the chart, whatever is on the right side of the ticker symbol, the dollar is your quote pair, and that is the value that will change. So uh, you're already long, meaning that your amount of Bitcoin won't change unless you do something, but your dollar valuation will change based on the actions of the market. So when you go short, so if you go short $1,000, you are now flat. You are, it is the same as sitting in cash. The only difference is, and the benefit to sitting in cash, in my opinion, is you are actively making Bitcoin as the market moves down. You're not making dollars. You have more Bitcoin and that Bitcoin is now at a cheaper price. So you still have the same dollar valuation, but you're not, but you are making Bitcoin, which means ideally if you go short, head short, and then price goes down and you cover at a lower price, and then price goes back up, you now have made money. You now have made dollars. You now have more Bitcoin and more dollars as a result. So uh, good stuff. Um, now, as far as hedging, uh, as far as hedging, I mean, this can be complicated, right? This can be complicated when you talk about when you talk about multi, multiple accounts. So for example, if you, as I do, have an account on Bybit and have an account on BitMEX and you go and you're, you're hedged, Uh, but you're taking maybe discretionary trades to the long side over on BitMEX. What you can do is you can hedge against that, meaning that you've now put the dollar loss on the trade flat. You've now put the dollar loss on the trade flat and you're just taking care of, you're just looking at the profit, whatever's profiting from the trade. Very similar to hedging against an altcoin trade. So for example, if you buy, uh, if you buy Bitcoin or excuse me, if you buy, if you are flat or if you're short, or if you're in a bearish market structure and you're going to take an alt to Bitcoin trade, 
you know, uh, you are going to diminish a little bit from the opportunity by going by hedging that amount of Bitcoin that you use to purchase the altcoin by hedging that and going short on that Bitcoin. But you're still going to get just the profit on the way up. You're still going to profit from the profit because you're going to get the difference, assuming you sell immediately right back into dollars or a dollar equivalent. So. You know, this is something, I mean, it all comes down to rebalancing too. Like, so for example, uh, if I am short, if I have $5,000 and I, let's go back to the $1,000 example. I'm short $1,000 with a Bitcoin and I don't have to worry about moving in and out of Tether, moving in and out of dollars. I just close my position. Everything's fine. That's how I much, much more prefer it. Uh, but if I then on BitMEX, take a long trade uh, and then I now have more dollars. Say the trade is successful, right? So I've now made more dollars. Well, then all I need to do is hedge that profit into my short, right? I need to now go short an additional amount of contracts to cover that new PL, right? So that I've now locked in the dollar value of my profits, right? Again, if price goes up, I'm going to lose Bitcoin, but not dollars. So, you know, hedging can be complicated, uh, but can also be very simple, man. And I think that just putting people on the right track, if, if you don't know what to do, just be one X short, lock in your dollar value. But that's coming from me. And I care. I use, I use trading income to pay my bills, right? So, um... This might be different from somebody who just trades to accumulate Bitcoin, which uh, I used to have that mindset and I do not anymore because my values have shifted and my income sources have shifted. Uh, Justin, why don't you go two to three X on your long-term Bitcoin investment, the bag? I mean, liquidation price is low. Plus, if price starts dropping, I can add extra at a lower price since this is long-term holding. Uh, you know, that might make sense for some people. It doesn't really make sense to me. Uh, I, When I invest in something, I invest to buy and hold it forever. And it might work out well if price goes up. But I don't want to... Um, well, actually, there's a bunch of reasons why that doesn't make sense. So the first one is I'm not going to deposit my investment on an exchange. I keep my investment in cold storage. And the reason why that is, is because that is my way of having unconfiscatable funds of being in my own bank. And it's an investment that I can pass down to my children. It's an investment that I can pass on to my loved ones. Should I pass away? Um, you know, I've taken precautions for that legally. And the, the whole risk of having the funds on an exchange is a untenable to me and b even though liquidation price is low it's still there it's still there right and god knows we've seen flash wicks and flash crashes and market manipulation rampant and i will be damned if i allow the actions of somebody else to take my unconfiscatable funds my unconfiscatable investment so my strategy toward investing is to buy and hold things forever. Uh, I only buy what I plan to hold until I die. I don't uh, sell things that I invest in. Um, yeah, yep. I just dollar cost average into my investments every single month. I've done that for a long time. I've bought Bitcoin every month for the last three years. Um, I've bought stocks every month for a long, long time. <laughs> uh, precious metal. So, you know, my investment strategy is just different. You know, I'm, I'm investing for my retirement. I'm investing for my future. I'm investing because that makes sense. I'm investing because it's habit. Um, and putting that, taking on the risk of additional gain, which again, I don't really need. Uh, you know, when you get to a level of profitability, it becomes about maintenance, uh, which is why, again, the best traders in the world focus more on money management and risk than uh, profit. Because profit comes when you just have a good system, right? But it's easy to just lose it all. So again, that might make sense for some, but I, I actually don't think it, it, it does make sense because then you're differentiating, you know, what is a trade and what is an investment, right? And I recommend that people be investing for the long term. You know, I think people need to make that delineation between what am I doing for the long term and what am I doing right now to be a profitable trader? And that's what's worked out for me. That's worked. And, and again, I started with nothing, guys. You know, I didn't start off with a million dollars. You know, I started out with, $5,000, you know, put the time in, put the grind in and it happens. So 
That's my thoughts on that, man. Thank you. Great question, though. All right, guys. Thank you guys so much for joining me for another exciting episode of Breaking Bitcoin. Today's episode was brought to you by the Kraken Cryptocurrency Premium Trading Group. If you guys are new, aspiring, or experienced traders, make sure to head over to premium.krakencryptocurrency.com and see what we can do to help you out reach your potential. If you guys have any questions, comments, concerns, sarcastic remarks, or death threats, please leave them in the comments section down below and I will do my best to reply to you within the next 48 hours hours that will also enter you into win our daily crypto comment giveaway winner make sure to check out this this month's sponsor at x42protocol.tech great project great people great team great discord by the way um we will be back here tomorrow at the same time on the same networks with the same face I'll see you guys tomorrow. Make sure to trade safely. Thank you guys so much for the support. Make sure to hit the like button on your way out. And if you want to check out the podcast and the show notes for today's show, breakingbitcoin.money, guys. Love you guys. Trade safely.